Live for the clan. That's what my father always said. Cyanvert remembered these words as he knelt in the midst of a chaotic battlefield. Blood dripped down his face, mingling with the grime and sweat of combat. His father's words echoed in his mind, reminding him of his duty, to desire nothing, to remain a shadow by his brother's side. Yet here he was, alone against the continent's strongest commanders. He sat on his knees, surrounded by the fallen bodies of knights, both friend and foe. A group of knights, still standing, watched him with a mix of awe and caution. One of them remarked in disbelief about how a single knight had managed to fend off their most formidable commanders. Among them, a commander stepped forward, his eyes fixed on Cyan. Cyan Vert, the commander called, his voice carrying a mixture of disdain and curiosity. Cyan lifted his head, meeting the commander's gaze. Boris, he responded, recognizing the man who had orchestrated this bloodshed. A smug look spread across Boris's face. You've put up quite a fight, Cyan. But it's over now. From thin air, Cyan drew his sword, the blade gleaming ominously despite the chaos around them. Who made you do this to me, Boris? Was it the Emperor, he demanded, an ominous aura beginning to envelop his body. Boris shielded his face with his arm, grimacing at the dark fog emanating from Cyan. That black fog of yours is sickening, he spat. The rumors were true. You are an assassin from Mist. Mist, the clandestine organization, elusive and deadly as fog, feared by the Knights of Light. Boris's voice dripped with contempt as he continued, I'll report to the higher-ups that I've eliminated an impure being affiliated with the heathens. Cyan's eyes narrowed. You can make your report when you still have a mouth to speak with, he retorted. I promise you, you won't have a single tooth left after this. Boris sneered. If you plan to use your secret power, give up now. There's a ninth star magic barrier cast around this area. Inwardly, Cyan knew he needed to escape, to reveal the true culprit behind this treachery to his brother. But there was no room for doubt. His fierce eyes locked onto Boris. Hell just pierced through your barrier, he declared. Before the clash could escalate, a commanding voice rang out. Stop. Both men turned to see a figure clad in golden armor approaching. Cyan's eyes widened in surprise and confusion. He recognized the man, a reputable warrior whose presence demanded respect. Live for the clan, his father had always said. And by extension, his brother Ashel was the clan. Ashel Vert's success was Cyan's success. The man in golden armor had blonde hair and stared at Cyan. Realization dawned upon Cyan, Ashel was behind it all. This revelation made his legs weak. Ashel, the man in golden armor, commented, Cyan, you seem confused now that I'm here. Cyan looked at him, desperation in his eyes. What is the meaning of this, Ashel? Ashel's expression softened slightly. You've carried out your duties well, Cyan. For the clan. For the people. And for me. Cyan's heart sank as he understood what was coming. I don't understand. Have I done something wrong? Wrong? Ashel echoed, his voice hardening. Look at that ominous fog you emit. You're nothing more than a murderer. Can you even still be called human? Cyan's mind reeled. The words murderer and sin echoed in his head. He had helped Ashel through countless trials, the succession fight within the empire, the demon king army's raid, the war to unify the continent. He had served his brother, lived for his brother. Fury overtook him, and he punched the ground. Slowly, Cyan stood up, dark aura oozing from his body. Driven by rage, his fog grew more intense. Blood pooled at his feet, but he didn't care if his body broke down. He would give everything he had now, if it meant destroying Ashel. Crimson mist covered the whole area, painting the sky red. The knights watched in shock at the sheer amount of mana Cyan still possessed. It was impossible for a human. The hero is trying to kill his younger brother out of fear, Cyan narrated, his voice filled with anger. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Ashel? Ashel's face contorted with fury, veins visible. Cyan launched at him with incredible speed, attacking relentlessly. Ashel deflected with his sword, but Cyan only needed one chance, one chance to stab Ashel's weak point and stop his regeneration. Their fight continued, Cyan's attack meeting a magic barrier. He hadn't expected his strongest blow to be blocked. Glancing around, he saw Boris assisting Ashel, reinforcing the barrier. You're a poor bastard, Ashel sneered, suddenly driving his sword into Cyan's stomach. Cyan gasped, dropping his dagger as pain surged through him. I wanted to give you a painless death, Cyan. Because you're my brother. But now you've shown your true colors. Cyan's expression revealed his heartbreak at Ashel's words. Ashel twisted the sword and kicked him, pulling the blade free and leaving Cyan lying on the ground. Blood pooled beneath him as Ashel walked away, leaving him to his fate. Cyan's mind raced as he lay there, blood pooling around him. Was this his end? He pondered the foolishness of his life, calling himself stupid. 
but as consciousness began to slip away, a surge of determination flared within him. He would not die here. Not like this. With a guttural scream, Cyan forced himself to his feet and chased after Ashel. His brother sensed the movement and turned just in time to see Cyan's dagger inches from his throat. Cyan released all his remaining power in that single, desperate attack. But before the blade could strike, a powerful force blew him away. He lost consciousness. A voice pierced through the darkness. Young Master Cyan. Cyan's eyes snapped open. He was drenched in sweat, his breath coming in ragged gasps. A maid stood before him, scolding him for oversleeping. Get your act together, Cyan. You need to get ready, she chided. He blinked in surprise. Emily? What are you doing here? Emily looked equally surprised. Cyan's mind raced as he realized something. It had been twenty years since he last saw her, yet she looked exactly the same. His surroundings, too, were familiar. It was the room he had lived in as a child, unchanged. Emily called his name again, snapping him out of his reverie. Are you stalling because you don't want to go to training? Make up your mind and get going. Cyan, bewildered, asked, what training? In the Vert Clan duchy, Cyan looked around, certain he had been transported back to his past. Was this what people meant when they said your life flashes before your eyes before death? He remembered the year, 985 Marchinist, 27 years ago. It was a year before he entered the academy. Every year, the duchy held a dual training session, a significant event attended by his father, Duke Vert. His opponent was Krantz Vert, his half-brother, the same age as Cyan. Krantz's mother, Margaret Ezra, was the duke's wife. As Cyan prepared for the training session, he couldn't shake the feeling of impending fate. He had a second chance, a chance to change everything. And this time, he would not let betrayal define his life. Despite being one of the youngest, Krantz Vert, Cyan's half-brother, received all the attention. Cyan was considered a bastard son, and after being mocked in their duel, he became the laughingstock of the duchy. The duel's outcome led to their father ignoring Cyan, turning him into an outcast within his own family. As the duel began, Emily, the loyal maid, whispered to Cyan, suggesting he should surrender. Young Cyan, determined and resolute, assured her it was okay. He just needed to win. In his mind, her suggestion felt like a condescending look down on him. Gripping his weapon, a rapier, Cyan noticed it felt heavy. He realized his strength was the same as when he was at that age. The sensation was not like a dream or a memory flashing before his eyes, it felt real. He had never heard of a magic spell capable of creating such strong illusions. He wondered if he had truly been sent back to the past. Krantz sneered, so, you didn't run off from the duel after all. Cyan thought to himself that this could be his chance to change the future. He looked at his father, Duke Vert, who declared the start of the match. Krantz attacked first, confident that he would hit his mark. Where are you looking, Cyan? Krantz taunted as he lunged forward. Cyan stood his ground, observing his brother. To him, Krantz moved like a snail. He shifted his stance slightly, and Krantz missed, stumbling past him. Infuriated, Krantz accused Cyan of dodging like a coward. Before Krantz could react further, Cyan struck his hand, sending Krantz's sword flying. With a swift kick to the shin, Krantz fell to the ground, groaning in pain and clutching his knees. Margaret Ezra, Krantz's mother, cried out in worry. Cyan knew that if he placed his sword at Krantz's throat, the duel would be over. But he gripped his sword tightly, recalling how Krantz had bullied him mercilessly, even at the academy. He decided he needed to make sure Krantz could never do anything like that again. Krantz, now terrified with tears streaming down his face, lay in pain. The duel ended with Krantz's loss. The duke ordered Cyan to see him, freeing up his schedule for this meeting. Cyan pondered if his victory was really that impressive. A high-class knight named Jokin, directly affiliated with the duke, escorted him. As they walked through the hallway, they encountered Margaret Ezra. It was clear she had spoken to the duke about her son. Cyan grinned when he saw the look on her face, as if she had stepped in something foul. Is Krantz okay? Cyan asked, feigning concern. Margaret's fury was palpable. You dare ask such a question after beating your brother like that? You're thick-skinned, Cyan. That's how duels are. Cyan said. She brushed past him, muttering, this is why bastards shouldn't be treated like legitimate children. With a devilish grin, Margaret continued, like mother, like son. Your mother is a dirty whore. You should be on the streets begging for food instead of daring to put up a fight. Cyan's eyes narrowed with murderous intent. She had crossed the line. He pondered if he should kill her right there but restrained himself. Instead, a grin flashed across his face. He knew how to make her suffer slowly, painstakingly slowly. Are you aware that I'm going to the academy with Krantz? he asked. Margaret's eyes narrowed. What's your point? 
I'm sure you want your son to graduate with all his limbs, right? Or maybe you're not that worried about him. Ha, huh, Duchess. Her rage boiled over. She raised her hand to slap him, calling him a vulgar piece of filth, but Jokin's arm blocked her. Jokin apologized to the Duchess, explaining that the Duke had urgently summoned Cyan. With a stern expression, he told the Duchess they had to leave. The Duchess remained silent, for the Duke's orders were absolute. Cyan peeked from behind Jokin, laughing. He was protected by the guard knight, a knight who not wanted to submit even to the Duke's wife. Cyan thought of how nice and reliable Jokin was. The door to the Duke's chamber opened, and the Duke himself told them to come in. Cyan entered the room, his heart pounding. He greeted the Duke. In his mind, Cyan reflected on how it had been nearly fifteen years since their last private meeting. Duke Willius Verth, the eminent feudal lord of Velius, a western province of the Ushif Empire, was known by many names, but the world revered him as the guardian of the continent. This title was earned through his heroic efforts to halt the demon invasions, utilizing his exceptional magical prowess and extraordinary intellect. Duke Willius carried this immense burden voluntarily, fighting valiantly until his demise in battle against the demon king's army. His ultimate aspiration was the peace and prosperity of the entire continent. To Cyan, however, the duke's legacy was painted differently. He saw Willius as a man who chose to live selflessly, dedicating his life to the service of others out of his own free will. In Cyan's eyes, this was foolish. The duke had once remarked on Cyan's uncanny ability to follow the trajectory of a sword and evade it with precision, a talent that left Krantz perplexed. The duke recounted a specific instance when Krantz had attacked, describing how Cyan had looked directly at the path of the swinging blade and deftly turned his body to avoid it. The duke inquired about Cyan's training in swordsmanship, noting that Cyan had never shown an interest in it before. Cyan, as always, found the duke's perceptiveness daunting. He confessed that he hadn't formally learned swordsmanship but had practiced secretly every night. The duke, seeking more information, asked why Cyan had hidden such exceptional skills. Cyan, embarrassed, explained that he had wished to avoid attracting attention. Yet, the duke was not satisfied with this answer, pointing out that despite his desire for anonymity, Cyan had exerted himself fully to defeat Krenz. The duke then brought up Cyan's actions afterward, specifically mentioning how he had kicked Krenz while he was down. The question seemed probing, as if the duke was trying to gauge Cyan's true capabilities. Cyan admitted that he had wanted to prove himself, to demonstrate that he was superior to Krenz despite their shared lineage. He asserted that this was the true purpose of the duel. The duke, finding amusement in Cyan's candidness, praised him for his clear and composed response, which showcased his level-headedness and undiscovered talent. The duke expressed his pleasure and foretold that Cyan would one day be a significant and dependable ally for Ashel. This prediction stirred a deep sense of betrayal within Cyan, rooted in his past life. He felt a wave of confusion and disappointment. Why should he be expected to support Ashel? It was always the same, the duke's obsession with Ashel remained unwavering. Anger welled up inside Cyan, his hands clenching into fists. The duke then offered a reward, asking Cyan if there was anything he desired. With a fierce resolve and sharp eyes, Cyan decided he would ruin everything Ashel had strived to achieve. He responded to the duke with his request, determined to see his plans through. Moments later, Emily's face turned ashen upon learning of Cyan's intention to join the battlefront. Cyan attempted to reassure her, stating that nothing was set in stone yet. Emily, however, was incredulous and questioned his sanity, emphasizing the horrific nature of the place he wished to go. She reminded him that the region was infested with monstrous demonic creatures. Valias, the western province of the Ushif Empire, was known as the battlefront, with Lima Valley being the epicenter of this centuries-long conflict with demons. Due to the perilous nature of Lima Valley, Duke Willius Verth, who had always vehemently opposed such an idea, presented Cyan with a challenge he must prove himself worthy of the battlefront within a month. The criteria for this worthiness remained unclear to Cyan, but he resolved to enhance his physical strength as much as possible in the given time. Though he acknowledged his current inferiority to his peers, he also recognized the advantage of retaining his combat instincts and the modest amount of magic he had detected within himself. He believed that with rigorous training, he could maximize his potential. Determined, Cyan began his training immediately. Suddenly, his door burst open, and a woman stormed in. It was Alice, her blue hair framing a stern expression. She seized him by the collar, shaking him vigorously. Emily, who had just greeted Lady Alice, watched as Alice confronted Cyan about his request to join the battlefront. Cyan's face went pale as he pleaded with Alice to release him. She complied, dropping him to the ground, leaving him feeling utterly drained. Alice remarked that defeating Kren seemed to have inflated Cyan's ego. 
she then ordered him to follow her to the rooftop. Once on the rooftop, Alice laid out her conditions. She told him that if he could endure her attacks for three minutes, she would consent to him going to the battlefront. Cyan, bewildered, asked if such drastic measures were necessary. Alice, unwavering, demanded that he answer a single question, was he seeking the family title? Cyan was taken aback by her assumption, as he had no interest in such matters. His silence, however, was misinterpreted by Alice as confirmation. She instructed him to draw his sword. Cyan, feeling overwhelmed, realized that his day had been nothing short of chaotic, especially considering his recent duel with Krenz. Nonetheless, he prepared himself as Alice launched her assault. Cyan hadn't anticipated it, but he managed to deflect Alice's strike, a feat that stunned her. For a ten-year-old to block an attack of that caliber seemed improbable. Cyan pondered if Alice truly intended to unleash her full strength against her younger brother, who was seven years her junior. Alice took a step back, processing what had just occurred. A rapier's blade was light and quick, yet Cyan had deftly parried her longsword. She questioned whether it was merely luck. She remarked that his intuition was sharper than she had expected. Seeing her expression, Cyan knew he was in trouble. Determined to test him further, Alice launched a barrage of ferocious attacks. She lunged at him with renewed intensity, but Cyan blocked her sword once more with his rapier. Not only that, he skillfully maneuvered his blade to position it parallel to her throat. Alice was momentarily taken aback. Cyan, straining under the effort, shifted his sword, but Alice retaliated, sending him flying. He landed atop a pillar, gasping for breath and contemplating how quickly things could turn dire. If he hadn't twisted his sword just right, he would have seriously injured her. His swordsmanship skill, thick fog, was designed for lethal efficiency. Cyan acknowledged the difficulty of fighting non-lethally given his current strength. He wondered how much time remained. He was compensating for his lack of power by imbuing his sword with mana, but his reserves were nearly depleted. Alice, also breathing heavily, invoked the elements of earth and wind to enhance her weapon. Cyan was astonished to witness her mastery of sixth-star magic. Alice's blade glowed with a blue aura, known as the Aqua Blade. With a mixture of desperation and determination, Cyan questioned if Alice intended to kill him. Her relentless muttering about not losing and the intensity in her eyes made it clear she was serious. Perched on the edge, Cyan foresaw disaster even if he managed to block her next attack. He decided to trust his instincts and hoped his plan would succeed. With a burst of speed, he charged at Alice. She was gathering power, her sword pointed skyward. Gripping his rapier tightly, Cyan silently prayed for intervention. As Alice's power surged, Cyan hoped for Yulkin's timely arrival. Just as Alice and Cyan were about to clash, Yulkin appeared, shouting, Stop! He intercepted Alice's blade with his own sword while grabbing Cyan by the back of his neck. The force of Alice's attack resulted in a massive explosion. Yulkin wore a stern expression as he addressed Lady Alice, chastising her for being too harsh on her much younger opponent. Cyan, still suspended from Yulkin's grasp, sighed in relief, having anxiously awaited Yulkin's arrival. As if snapping out of a trance, Alice gasped and immediately embraced her brother, apologizing profusely. She confessed that she must have momentarily lost her mind, tears and snot streaming down her face as she expressed her desperation to prevent him from going to the battlefield. Cyan smiled, thinking how typical it was of Alice to be so intense and passionate. She always put her heart into everything she did. Alice was the epitome of excellence, excelling in all subjects at the Royal Academy, where the most talented children gathered, whether in swordsmanship, magic, or academics. Her beauty was unparalleled, earning her the moniker, God's Child. From a young age, she had trained in swordsmanship and was regarded as a future guardian of the continent, along with their eldest brother, Achelivert. Tragically, she was killed shortly after joining the Knights of Light. Cyan hugged her tightly, thinking of how much he had missed her. His embrace caught Alice's attention, and in his mind, he vowed to protect her this time. Alice then turned her attention to Yulkin, puzzled, and asked he was the Duke's guardian knight. She was confused since the Duke had just left for the war. Yulkin explained that he was following the Duke's orders to protect the young master for a while. Although he was supposed to carry out this duty in secret, Cyan had sensed Yulkin's presence since leaving the Duke's office. Cyan wondered if Yulkin would have remained hidden if he hadn't noticed him. He also questioned why his father had instructed Yulkin to follow him secretly. Suddenly, Cyan felt groggy, and Alice caught him as he fell asleep, smiling and commenting on how he was still a little kid. The next day, Alice returned to the academy, having come back briefly to see their father before her graduation. Cyan, feeling the urgency to grow stronger, focused on strength training for the past two weeks, though ten push-ups were his limit. 
He felt like he had hit a wall and knew he needed a new approach. Emily knocked on his door to inform him that a package had arrived. Cyan's excitement grew as Emily brought it in, complaining about the foul smell. It was the hellhound's blood he had requested, a rare item from Lima Valley that he had heard was available on the black market. The blood of demonic beasts was notorious for its poisonous smell and the burning sensation it caused upon consumption, but it was also rumored to permanently increase the consumer's mana and strength. Most dismissed this as mere myth, but Cyan knew from past experience that it was true. Emily asked if he was really going to drink it, and he confidently answered yes. In his mind, Emily need not worry, since he had survived her cooking before. He chugged down the blood, reminded of the first time he had tasted her mushroom soup, which had caused his heart to stop momentarily. Compared to that, the blood was nothing. He finished the entire drink, remarking on how surprisingly palatable it was. A surge of power coursed through his veins. Turning to Emily, he announced his intention to go for a walk, eager to test the effects. Cyan stepped outside, heading toward a mountain that overlooked the duchy. It had been some time since he last visited this place, a spot he frequented when he wanted solitude. He had been waiting for this moment for the past two weeks, a time when Yolkin was absent for his regular reports. The mountain was a place of peace for him, but today, it held a deeper significance. Ashel had once received a divine revelation from Lumendal, the god of light, about an ancient temple hidden in these mountains. Though skeptical, Ashel had discovered a spot where the flow of mana was concentrated. The revelation had not yet occurred, but Cyan was already aware of its existence. Cyan knelt, placing his hand on the ground. His power radiated through the earth, causing it to crack and reveal an underground passage. He grinned, relishing the thought that Ashel had no clue about his actions. Entering the passage, he noticed changes since his last visit. This was an ancient temple dedicated to Lumendal, erased from history following the Demon Wars 300 years ago. The temple's existence in the mountains behind the castle was a well-kept secret. Ahead of him lay a glowing sword on a pedestal. This was Duran Dark, a holy relic blessed by Lumendal. In 999 BFA, on August 12, humanity had driven the Demon King's army from Valias using ancient relics known as the God's Weaponry. Duran Dark had played a crucial role in their victory, and Cyan's future demise would be linked to this very sword, eventually wielded by a shelvard. Cyan pondered if the sword had any connection to his regression. He reached out to touch Duran Dark, but as he anticipated, nothing happened. Frustrated, he kicked the pedestal, cursing the so-called Holy Sword. His mood soured, he mocked it, holy sword, my ass. He turned to leave, intent on completing his business elsewhere. Unbeknownst to him, the sword seemed to react to his disdain. As he walked past a beam of light, he felt an eerie presence. Shadows coalesced into a form, something otherworldly emerging from the depths. Cyan said, found it. At first glance, it appeared to be the shadow of a sword. However, it was far more than just a shadow. Cyan channeled his power into it, revealing a hidden pathway behind the altar of light. As he opened the door, he was greeted by the sight of his sword, glowing red atop a pedestal. Nice to see you again, Cyan murmured to the sword. He grasped the hilt of Kyram, the demonic sword he had wielded before his death. As soon as he touched it, an ominous, powerful aura emanated from the blade. Good morning, Kyram, he said, though the sword did not respond. Cyan wondered if it was still dormant. Despite this, he felt an exhilaration that made him want to test the blade's edge immediately. A shadow with sharp eyes materialized on the ground, asking Cyan if he felt no fear. Kyram's voice echoed, questioning if Cyan understood the implications of awakening it. Cyan shrugged, replying nonchalantly that he didn't care and that perhaps it meant the sword was now his. The shadow grew larger and more menacing, informing him that it was too late for regrets now that he had awakened a demonic sword. The shadow grinned, revealing rows of pointed teeth and lunged at Cyan, claiming his body would belong to it. But Cyan, unperturbed, casually choked the shadow. You weren't this pathetic before, he remarked. The shadow began to dissipate, revealing a human face. Kyram, astonished, wondered how Cyan could touch it. In response, Cyan reiterated that the sword was his. Kyram's long, pink, pointed nails slashed at Cyan as she screamed. He lost his grip, and Kyram leapt backward. When fully revealed, Kyram was a woman. She demanded to know who he was, noting the dark aura surrounding him. She asked if he was the successor. Why do I sense Eru's aura from you? Kyram demanded, her eyes narrowing with suspicion. Cyan's grin widened, a devilish glint in his eyes. You're right. I am Eru's successor, he declared confidently. Your master is back, Kyram. Now, bow down. Kyram's expression hardened. You're just a child. I refuse to accept this. A battle ensued. 
Cyan quickly realized that words alone wouldn't convince the demonic sword. He knew that Kyram's ultimate goal was to dominate the body of its wielder. With no other option, he decided to show his strength. Cyan's grin turned feral as he activated demonic sword control. Instantly, Kyram was pulled to the ground with a bone-jarring impact that made her groan. I'll say this once, Cyan warned, his voice cold. Why won't you accept me as your master while I'm still being nice? Kyram gritted her teeth. How can you wield that power, she spat, defiance in her eyes. Cyan activated demonic sword control again, smashing her face into the ground repeatedly. Her head was soon buried deep in the earth. Ready to accept me now? Cyan asked, his tone dripping with mockery. I accept, Kyram muttered, though she called him, human. Cyan was about to activate demonic sword control again, but stopped when she hastily corrected herself, master. Satisfied, Cyan felt it was time to return. He had been gone too long. Kyram, now in her sword form, sighed contentedly. It's been so long since I felt fresh air, she said, her voice echoing from the blade. She emerged from the sword, looking like a black balloon with eyes, a mouth, and pink hair. This is refreshing, she exclaimed. Master, what is your name? Cyan, he replied, giving his full name. I've never heard that name before, Kyram commented, still skeptical. Did Eru really choose a kid like you? In my past life, yes, Cyan answered, his expression serious. Kyram looked confused. Past life? I died once before, Cyan explained. Kyram's eyes widened in disbelief. What the hell, she thought, and then she noticed something else. In front of them stood another sword, gleaming in the dim light. She remarked on how he was still sleeping, unaware of the events unfolding around him. Cyan mused aloud that the sword would have to wait twenty years for its rightful owner. Kyram, puzzled, pointed out that Cyan spoke as if he knew the future. Gripping his sword, Cyan adopted a combat stance. Without warning, he swiftly severed the handle of the sword before them. Kyram, taken aback, questioned his intentions. With a devilish grin, Cyan hinted that this might make future events more interesting. As the sun set, the carriage moved away from the castle, eventually slowing to a stop. Cyan, wearing a shield on his chest, reflected on how quickly time had passed. He greeted the duke, who informed him that this would be the last time he would ask the question. The duke inquired if Cyan was still resolved to go to the battlefront, offering him a chance to back out. Cyan, confident, affirmed his determination, stating that his heart was already set on the battlefront. The duke then instructed Yulkin to reveal what he had. Holding a scroll, Yulkin unrolled it, and a fiery creature with sharp claws appeared, a hellhound, a demonic beast from the Lemia Valley. Cyan recognized the effort his father and the knights must have put into preparing this trial. The knights, ready to intervene if necessary, placed their hands on their swords. The duke emphasized that Cyan was responsible for his actions and urged him to prove his resolve by passing the trial. Yulkin, gripping his sword tightly, remembered when Cyan had invited him for a duel. Cyan had explained that with only three days left until his promise to his father was due, he needed to experience a real fight. He asked Yulkin to help him, but Yulkin suggested he duel with someone his own age, like the young master Krantz. Cyan explained that Krantz avoided him, leaving him no other choice. Reluctantly, Yulkin agreed but insisted he would only use his sword sheath and focus on defense, urging Cyan to attack freely. Cyan thanked him but made Yulkin promise not to tell the duke about their duel, emphasizing it as an order. The seriousness in Cyan's expression puzzled Yulkin. Cyan attacked, and though Yulkin blocked it, he was astonished by the weight of the blow, especially from a ten-year-old. Before he could recover, Cyan attacked again, moving with surprising speed and disappearing from Yulkin's sight. He wondered where Cyan had vanished, then sensed him behind. Just in time, he managed to defend. Cyan launched a series of relentless attacks, taking the duel very seriously. Our protagonist, giving his all, found every strike deflected by Yulkin. Accepting his current limits, he acknowledged that he couldn't yet defeat Yulkin and thanked him for the effort. Yulkin, breathing heavily, praised the young master. Inwardly, he marveled at how much Cyan had grown from the weak boy he once knew. In the present, Yulkin's confidence in Cyan's potential was reaffirmed. The hellhound moved swiftly, its focus locked on Cyan. As it charged, Cyan anticipated its attack, understanding that with his current strength, he needed to end the battle swiftly. The hellhound prepared for another strike, but Cyan, having already planned his next move, assumed a combat stance. As it lunged, he leapt into the air and drove his sword into its skull. The knights were astonished, and the duke looked pleased. Cyan surveyed the fallen hellhound, noting the blood spilling from its neck. He mused that such blood could fill several bottles but knew collecting it now would seem strange. The duke clapped, 
commending Cyan for his impressive display and confirmed they would see each other at the battlefront. Cyan thanked his father. Kyram, a small wisp of smoke on his shoulder, appeared. She demanded if he saw her as a kitchen knife, to which Cyan, unperturbed, replied, of course not. You're a demonic sword. Why would you ask that? Kyram retorted, urging him to use her, lamenting that she needed blood to gain strength. She eyed the hellhound's corpse, tongue out, begging for just a taste. Cyan assured her that he would soon use her to the fullest, telling her to anticipate it eagerly. Kyram grumbled that he should have woken her then. Soon, an ogre emerged to the northwest. The duke commanded the knights to set up a defensive line and eliminate the threat immediately, instructing them to leave no one alive. The knights, responding with a shout, began the restraint of salvation. A glowing yellow symbol appeared in the air, illuminating the surroundings. A magic circle formed beneath the ogres, ensnaring them with restraints that immobilized the monstrous creatures. The duke gave the command, and the knights charged, slicing through the ogres with precision. The air filled with the roars of the dying ogres, but the knights remained steadfast, fulfilling their duty with bravery and skill. The ogres fell swiftly under their blades. Cyan, seated on his horse, observed the scene with a calm demeanor. Behind him, Emily clung to the saddle, trembling and tearful. She asked the young master, her voice shaking, why he insisted on coming to such a dangerous place. Despite her distress, Cyan felt a wave of nostalgia wash over him. The duke approached and inquired how Cyan felt being on the front lines. Cyan confessed to feeling a bit nervous. The duke nodded, sharing his wisdom, in a place like this, death could come at any moment. He advised Cyan to remain vigilant at all times. Cyan promised to keep that in mind, aware that unpredictability was a constant companion on the front lines. He understood the rhythm of life here, three to four battles a day, each with its own strategy and response plan. The knights, ever vigilant, formed a strong defense against the encroaching monsters. Cyan noted that his assigned group was stationed in the safest part of the camp, far from the front lines. The guards' discipline was impeccable, making it difficult for Cyan to find an opportunity to feed Karim. He resigned himself to waiting until dinner. Emily, still trembling, huddled under a blanket. She reminded Cyan of the Duke's warning, they never knew when or where they might die. Cyan, exasperated, asked why she didn't just leave if she was so afraid. Emily shot back, her voice loud and filled with frustration, pointing out that he couldn't manage without her. She made it clear that with monsters everywhere, she couldn't abandon him. With a sigh, she told him it was time to eat and instructed him to move. When Cyan inquired about the cake he had requested, Emily ignored him and left the tent. Cyan, holding back his irritation, wondered what would happen if he simply sent her away. Yet, he couldn't imagine doing so, despite how she treated him. Later that night, Cyan placed a doll that resembled him in his bed, covering it with a blanket to create the illusion that he was sleeping. Cyan adjusted his disguise, hoping it would be enough to avoid detection. Emily, still half asleep, asked if he was planning to exercise even here. He confirmed, asking if he had disturbed her. Her eyes remained closed as she praised his diligence, mentioning that the duke would be proud of him. Donning his hood, Cyan informed her that he was heading out and requested her to handle things as usual. Before leaving the tent, he reiterated that she should act as if he were asleep. Aware of the heightened security on the front lines, Cyan sprinted away swiftly, knowing that his window of freedom was narrow. Utilizing his skill, thick fog, he invoked Fog's Descent, navigating through the camp based on memory until he reached an area teeming with monsters, an ideal setting to unleash Kyram. The demonic sword sensed the rich scent of blood, growing excited and urging Cyan to move quickly. Several hellhounds lunged at them, and Cyan, agreeing with Kyram, promised they would indulge. Together, they dispatched the monsters effortlessly, reveling in the ensuing bloodbath. Cyan activated Fog Sword, summoning Rushing Fog Storm, and cut through numerous creatures, moving like a whirlwind. After the skirmish, Cyan inserted a tube into a fallen monster's corpse, draining blood into a mug. Drinking the fresh blood, he looked almost deranged as he muttered, This is the stuff. Kyram, too, felt invigorated, expressing her delight at feeling so refreshed. Cyan declared that they would continue training this way. Kyram questioned how long it would take to grow stronger by killing these creatures. Just then, more hellhounds approached from behind. Sensing them, Cyan reassured Kyram, promising a long night of hunting and plenty of monsters to slay. Kyram's excitement grew at the prospect of facing ogres, hellhounds, and giant crocodiles. Meanwhile, in the mountains, a carriage escorted by knights traveled cautiously. Inside, a girl with silver hair listened to a companion who worried about the dangers of the front lines. The woman suggested turning back, 
but the girl, revealing herself as the royal princess, insisted she was bound by duty to assist her father. Irritated, she reminded the woman not to treat her like a child and warned she would become angry if the topic was raised again. The woman acquiesced, then shifted the conversation, mentioning that the youngest son of the Vert family was also on the front lines. She noted that he was around the same age as the princess. Surprised, the princess asked why Duke Vert had brought his youngest son. Her attendant explained that the boy had volunteered. Suggesting that they might get along due to their similar ages, the attendant's idea was met with feigned disinterest from the princess, who then announced her intention to sleep. The attendant complied, but after a pause, the princess inquired about the boy's name. Cyan Vert, came the reply, which the princess repeated to herself, committing it to memory. The scene shifted to the princess's revealed face, marking her introduction as a significant character in the story. A monstrous creature was sliced to its demise. The duke, concerned for his men, ordered an immediate check to ensure no one was injured. Reports soon confirmed that everyone was unharmed, much to his relief. He praised his soldiers for their hard work and ordered them to return to their duties. The duke then surveyed the area. He had noted the individual who had felled the last flying beast, Cyan. Approaching him, the duke inquired about Cyan's adjustment to the front lines. Cyan respectfully replied that he was learning new things every day, a response that surprised the duke. He had expected his son to express a desire to return home quickly. Instead, he acknowledged that Cyan had endured much and expressed his pride in him. This unexpected praise caught Cyan off guard. Before departing, the duke informed Cyan that he wished to discuss something important with him the next morning and asked him to visit his tent early. Cyan was taken aback by this uncharacteristic kindness from his father. As night fell, an eerie atmosphere settled over the camp. Suddenly, a monster with a long body emerged from the ground. Reacting quickly, Cyan managed to evade the creature, it was a death worm, a gigantic beast with a tail end lined with sharp teeth, usually found deeper in the valley. Karam, observing the struggle, offered to take over, claiming her master might be in trouble. Cyan, however, was wary of her intentions, suspecting a hidden agenda. Karam denied any ulterior motives, promising to use the opportunity briefly before relinquishing control back to him. The death worm's body exuded a faint smoke as it sustained shallow injuries, regenerating almost instantly. Karam pointed out the futility of attacking it superficially. Cyan realized that Karam was right, continuing like this would be pointless. It had already been a month since Cyan had joined the front lines, and despite having drunk the blood of countless demonic beasts, he still felt unsatisfied. The death worm launched an attack, forcing Cyan to make a quick decision. He decided to play along with Karam's plan for the time being. Karam, eager to unleash her powers, activated the ninth form of her demonic sword manifestation, creating a thick fog. She aimed to tear through the death worm's tough skin with a swift move, inflicting several deep wounds. Blood gushed from the death worm, and Karam followed up with her next skill, the fog sword, eight fluttering petals. Moving swiftly along the creature's body, she sliced it repeatedly, weakening it further. Blood sprayed the area as the death worm's strength waned, and eventually, its body was severed into pieces. Meanwhile, the duke's party came across a recently slain monster. Jokin noted the imposing mana surrounding the corpse and suspected it might be the work of a demon. The duke, not willing to overlook the presence of a demon, ordered a thorough inspection of the area and immediate incineration of the corpse. Upon closer inspection, the duke recognized the familiar traces of the sword. He felt a sense of deja vu but was soon called by Elkin to inspect another site. Jokin raised his torch to reveal the corpse of a death worm. The duke, astonished, wondered who could have slain such a beast. He suspected it might be the work of an organization he knew of. Cyan, regaining control of his body, realized that allowing Karam to take over, even momentarily, had been a risky decision. Demonic sword manifestation allowed Karam to utilize her true powers but also gave her the potential to fully control Cyan if he let his guard down. He woke up the feeling sore all over, a stark reminder of the previous night's battle. Cyan thought it was fortunate that he had consumed all that demonic beast blood. If this had happened a month ago, his body would have collapsed under the strain. Suddenly, Kyram spoke up, claiming she had figured everything out. Cyan was puzzled, unable to follow her meaning. She elaborated, noting that while Cyan outwardly appeared to be a child, his behavior and speech were far from childish. Kyram observed that his proficiency in handling her was too advanced for a first-timer. Additionally, he possessed an intimate knowledge of the Lima Valley's geography and wielded sword techniques resembling those honed over thirty years. Moreover, Cyan had mentioned that he had already died once. This led Kyram to conclude that he was a regressor. 
Cyan looked at her incredulously and asked if it wasn't obvious when he said he had died before. He thought he had made it clear enough. Kyram was taken aback and then angered, exclaiming that he hadn't explained anything. Cyan nonchalantly replied that he was too lazy to elaborate. Switching topics, Kyram remarked that killing Cyan must have been difficult. She speculated on the events leading to his death, suggesting he might have been killed by the owner of Duran D. Arc, either in a duel or through betrayal. She leaned toward the latter, reasoning that Cyan looked at the Holy Sword with disdain. Kyram deduced that Cyan's goal was likely revenge. She warned him that if she ever saw him falter, she would take over his body completely. Cyan smacked her on the head, reminding her to know her place, leaving Kyram dizzy on the ground. In his mind, Cyan reflected that she hadn't changed at all, she was exactly the same as in his previous life. Leaving the tent, Cyan noticed a commotion around him. Emily greeted him hurriedly, and he asked if something had happened. Emily reported that high-level monsters had been sighted near the valley's entrance. Cyan felt a pang of nervousness, suspecting she might be referring to the deathworm. Emily added that it had been a long time since such monsters appeared near the camps. Cyan inquired if she knew anything else, specifically about any suspicious individuals or anything related to him. Before Emily could respond, Jokin called for Cyan, informing him that the Duke wanted to see him immediately. Feeling slightly apprehensive, Cyan thought of the situation as a nuisance. He hadn't been able to dispose of the corpses the previous night because soldiers had shown up unexpectedly. He gritted his teeth, worrying that his plan to enjoy a quiet life before entering the academy might be ruined. Arriving at the Duke's tent, he greeted his father, expecting him to realize he was the one who had slain the monsters. The Duke acknowledged his presence and asked him to sit. Cyan, looking serious and nervous, anticipated a difficult conversation. He racked his brain for a plausible excuse. The Duke began directly, asking Cyan what he had been doing the previous night. Cyan claimed he had gone to bed early due to exhaustion. The Duke found this suspicious, noting that the sword traces resembled Cyan's technique. However, he started to think he might be overanalyzing the situation. Cyan asked why the Duke was inquiring, which brought the Duke back from his thoughts. The Duke rationalized that it was impossible for someone as young as Cyan to have slain a death worm. Seeing his father distracted, Cyan called for his attention. The Duke assumed Cyan was already aware of the previous night's events and decided to investigate further, suspecting the involvement of the secret organization, MIST. Cyan pretended this was his first time hearing about MIST. The Duke explained that MIST was an ancient organization, notorious for assassinating nobles under the guise of purification, leaving behind black fog wherever they operated. They had vanished a hundred years ago, but the Deathworm's corpse was shrouded in black fog, a mark of Eru, the god of darkness worshipped by Mist and the source of their power. The Duke speculated that Mist was responsible for the Deathworm and other demonic beast killings. Cyan marveled at his father's ability to deduce the culprit despite Mist's last known activity being centuries ago. The Duke admitted they had no clear reason for Mist's sudden reappearance and advised Cyan to stay vigilant. Nonetheless, he planned to notify the Empire and conduct a thorough investigation. With that, Cyan believed his father had accepted the explanation. In his mind, the Duke found it implausible for someone as young as Cyan to be involved with such an ancient organization. He decided to end that line of inquiry and moved on. Turning to Cyan, he asked if he knew who was visiting them today. Cyan replied that he had heard His Majesty would be visiting, but didn't realize it was today. The Duke then requested a favor, which made Cyan slightly anxious. Moments later, the sound of a horn echoed through the camp, followed by the announcement of the emperor's arrival. All the knights, including the duke, knelt in respect. The emperor dismounted his horse, calling the duke by his first name in an excited tone. He tapped the duke on the shoulder, urging him not to be so formal since they were old friends. When the emperor's gaze fell on Cyan, he remained indifferent. Cyan introduced himself respectfully. The emperor commented that a boy Cyan's age living in such an environment was evidence that the duke's children were extraordinary. Cyan, remembering the favor his father had asked of him, displayed a goofy smile. Initially nervous, he realized the favor was simply to present himself as the duke's son. In his past life, Cyan had always been confined to the mansion during the emperor's visits. Now, he felt deeply touched by his father's trust. The emperor then announced that he wanted to introduce someone as well. A young lady stepped out of the carriage and introduced herself as Aaron Severus, the fifth princess of the Ushif Empire. Cyan recalled her as the tragic fifth princess. Earlier, the duke had asked Cyan to escort Princess Aaron for the day. Although Cyan was unsure how to handle it, the duke assured him that all he needed to do was keep her company. He explained that the princess was the same age as Cyan, and they would likely see each other more often at the academy. 
Cyan remembered seeing her in his past life between classes. The duke encouraged Cyan to become acquainted with the princess, hinting at the potential benefits of befriending someone from the royal family. Although Cyan internally resisted the idea, he understood his father's intentions. The duke likely hoped for a friendship similar to his own with the emperor. However, Cyan doubted this would happen with Princess Aaron, given the future events only he knew about. Despite his annoyance, he decided to comply for now. As Princess Aaron began to speak, Cyan focused his attention. She asked why the river was red. Cyan confirmed she was referring to the Blood River and explained that it was a stream running through the entire Lemia Valley. The water turned red due to demonic beasts, who, when old or injured and unable to compete for survival, instinctively jumped into the river. Their corpses and bodily fluids decomposed in the water, tinted by the mana, giving the river its distinctive color. The princess's expression turned to shock and disgust upon learning this. Cyan casually added that demonic beasts also drank and bathed in the river, advising her to stay out of it due to its disgusting nature. The princess, still disgusted, asked what lay at the end of the river. Cyan replied that it led to the demon realm. The princess was extremely shocked and wanted to confirm if it was truly where demons lived. Seizing the opportunity to tease her, Cyan, with a mischievous grin, told her that if she followed the river, she might even meet the demon king. The princess was terrified after hearing that. In his mind, Cyan knew no rational person would actually follow the river to the demon realm. However, he found it entertaining to tease the princess. Suddenly, a bright light flared up, capturing everyone's attention. The princess, startled, asked what it was. Cyan explained that it was the signal from the 3rd century post in the west. A yellow light indicated approaching demonic beasts. The princess was taken aback by the presence of demonic beasts. Immediately, the duke issued an order to ensure the emperor's protection. He directed the guardian knight division to accompany him to the 3rd century post. The emperor, addressing the duke by his first name, Willius, told him not to be so cautious. The duke was perplexed by this response. The emperor asked if the duke thought he had come for a leisurely stroll and, to underline his point, drew his sword. The duke sighed but acquiesced to the emperor's wishes. The emperor then commanded his knights to join the demonic beast raid, instructing them to focus solely on exterminating the beasts until the raid concluded. The duke also ordered Cyan to participate, to which Cyan readily agreed. The princess, concerned, asked Cyan if he could really fight the demonic beasts. He assured her that he could, mentioning that he often provided support from the back. He then advised the princess to retreat to the shelter for safety. Unexpectedly, the princess insisted on accompanying him. Internally, Cyan was baffled by her insistence. She argued that they were the same age, so she should be allowed to come too. With a bored expression, Cyan explained that battles were dangerous and not a playground. Despite his warning, the princess persisted. Growing increasingly annoyed, Cyan called for Jokin. Jokin appeared promptly, stating that he would take over from the royal knights and escort the princess to safety. He courteously invited the princess to come with him. The princess looked at Cyan, feeling affronted, and accused him of impudence for daring to treat her, a princess, in such a manner. Cyan stepped closer to her, his eyes wide and his tone firm. He told her that her stubbornness could cost the lives of dozens of knights. He emphasized that in battle, a split-second decision could mean the difference between life and death. In a menacing tone, he asked if she could take responsibility for all those lives. The princess's eyes welled up with tears. As Cyan turned to leave, he told her to return to the shelter if she was going to cry like a child. The princess, Jokin, and her maid stood there, taken aback. Meanwhile, the knights encountered a massive slime-like monster that had already devoured several humans. The duke commanded them to hold their ground. As they neared the creature, he ordered them to halt and reform their lines. He then commanded everyone to protect his majesty and to slay every single monster, sparing none. Diane Severus, the emperor of the Ushif Empire, was married to two women over his reign. His first wife, Diana Quizzel, has passed away. His second wife, Cassandra Napellus, holds a significant role as the empire's foremost judicial authority. Diana, the former empress, bore him two daughters, the first and second princesses. Cassandra, the current empress, bore him two sons, the third and fourth princes. However, there is also a fifth princess, Aren Severus, who was born out of wedlock to a peasant mistress. Aren, due to her mixed heritage, was often scorned and treated like a mere figurehead of royalty. Despite this, she remained unfazed by others' opinions, dutifully serving the royal family and dedicating herself to her studies with unmatched diligence. Tragically, she was falsely accused of treason by those who despised her and was subsequently expelled from the royal family and the empire. 
rumors later circulated that she died alone from an illness on a remote island, earning her the moniker of the tragic princess. People believed that her downfall was due to her ambitions and that a simpler life without aspirations might have been better for her. Karim recounted this story to Cyan, attributing it to the tales shared by the Duke about his past life. Shaun noted the difference, remarking that the princess's fate was deeply entwined with royal politics. As lightning struck a distant monster, Cyan observed several more bolts of lightning and commented on the emperor's prowess. Emperor Diane possessed the ability known as Holy Lightning, which he wielded to eliminate the monsters. Publicly acknowledged as an eight-star mage, Diane's magical prowess was so formidable that, had he not ascended to the throne, he would likely have been the head of the mage association. Cyan mused with amusement that the emperor could easily handle an intermediate-rank demonic beast and speculated that ruling the empire might just be a hobby for him. Following the brief skirmish, an exquisite liquor was served, and the emperor remarked on the rarity of sharing a drink with his old friend, Villiarth. However, he felt a bit lonely being the only one drinking. The duke apologized, explaining that he abstains from alcohol while on the front lines. The emperor then shared his concerns when the duke inquired about the current state of the empire. He revealed a recent surge in noble assassinations, which was causing widespread anxiety among the populace. The duke inquired if any patterns had emerged in the string of noble assassinations. The emperor confirmed, noting that all the slain nobles were corrupt officials and that each crime scene was marked by the presence of a black fog. Curious, the emperor asked the duke if he had any insights. The duke revealed that he had encountered similar traces at the battlefront, suggesting that the emperor's suspicions about the movements of certain followers were correct. However, the emperor tasked the duke with further investigation. Expressing his gratitude but emphasized the growing anxiety among the people, which he could not ignore. Another concern troubled the emperor, some nobles were maliciously blaming the fifth princess, Aren, for the incidents. When the duke sought clarification, the emperor explained that he had dismissed these accusations as baseless, yet it seemed there was a faction intent on exploiting her. As a friend rather than an emperor, Diane requested a favor from the duke, should he perish before the duke, he wanted him to look after Aren. Villiarth Vart solemnly promised to fulfill the emperor's wish. Diane expressed his thanks. Later that day, heavy rain began to fall, and everyone took shelter in their tents, including Emily, who seemed puzzled by the day's events. Cyan asked her what she expected, to which Emily replied that dealing with a princess should have been more significant. She chided Cyan, suggesting that his approach would prevent him from ever marrying. Amused, Cyan thought to himself that the interaction hadn't even been a date. He prepared to leave, entrusting Emily with the responsibilities in his absence. Emily questioned his intention to train in such heavy rain, but Cyan reassured her. Unbeknownst to him, someone stood outside his tent. Emily was taken aback upon seeing the figure and inquired who it was. The girl lowered her hood, revealing herself to be Princess Aren. She asked Cyan if he was available for a chat. Excited, Emily acted like a fangirl upon seeing the princess. The three of them entered the tent, guarded by royal knights outside. Aren asked Cyan how long he had been there, to which he replied it had been a month. When he inquired about the reason for her visit, Aren hesitated and then requested that the maid be excused due to her staring. Cyan asked Emily to step outside. As she left, Emily's comment about having a good time together bewildered them both. Cyan humorously thought to himself that enjoying time with a ten-year-old was out of the question. Princess Aren, blushing, apologized for her earlier behavior, acknowledging it was unworthy of a princess. Cyan reassured her, saying it was no issue and apologized for his own rudeness. Aren laughed and admitted she would have felt the same in his position. She noted how respected and mature Cyan seemed compared to her. From this exchange, Cyan gained insight into Aren's character. She then asked if he was also joining the academy, hinting at the possibility of friendship. Before Princess Aren could finish her sentence, Cyan interrupted her with an apology. He told her that he believed he wouldn't be of any help to her. This statement shook the princess deeply. Cyan then bluntly suggested that if she was there just to make friends, she should leave. With tears streaming down her face, Aren expressed her desire to be on good terms, accusing Cyan of being harsh. Despite her emotional display, there was a menacing aura about her as she asked if he, too, considered her merely a shell of a princess. Cyan remained silent. The princess, feeling defeated, retreated, saying she understood there was no benefit in befriending her and apologized for wasting his time. She lamented her naivety in thinking they could at least have a conversation. Aren then compared him to Sir Ashel, stating he was completely different. This struck a nerve in Cyan, stirring deep emotions. He grabbed her arm, causing Aren to yell in surprise and demand to know what was wrong with him. 
Cyan, with murderous eyes, demanded to know how she knew his brother. Aran explained that she had met Ashel during a tour of the Royal Academy the previous year. He had advised her to disregard others' opinions and focus on fulfilling her role as a princess. Cyan, in his mind, scoffed at what he perceived as hollow advice, knowing his brother's true nature better than anyone. He realized that everything had started when Ashel met Aran, suspecting a plot against her. Their tense conversation was abruptly interrupted by a loud noise. Emily rushed into the tent, urging Cyan to run, but the tent's roof had already been breached. A powerful attack landed with a thunderous impact. The knights cursed as they watched a gigantic ogre swing its bat-like weapon into the young master's tent. They hurried to check on Cyan's condition. Emily, seeing the weapon embedded in the ground, was overwhelmed with worry and called out for the young master, tears streaming down her face. The monster revealed itself to be a giant ogre. Meanwhile, in another location, the emperor was taken aback by a report. Advanced rank demonic beasts had ambushed the rear camps of the border regions, where Princess Aran happened to be. The emperor immediately ordered the imperial army to head to the rear camps, prioritizing the princess's safety. He wondered who she had been planning to see there. Back at the scene, Cyan, still alive, observed the chaos from behind the debris. Several ogres, along with deathworms, were part of the attack. Cyan, Emily, Princess Aran, and several knights took cover behind a large rock. These monsters should only have been found in the deeper regions of the valley, yet they were now attacking the rear camp. Cyan suspected that something significant had changed, and wondered if it was connected to him. Emily, sobbing, called out to him, initially believing he was dead and vowing never to leave his side again. When the roof of the tent had collapsed earlier, Cyan had immediately rushed to protect Princess Aran. He thought to himself that having once slain the demon king, he wouldn't fall to a mere ogre. Princess Aran expressed her concern for the knights at the camp, but Emily assured her that they were strong and capable. Fighting back her tears, blamed herself for endangering the knights by coming to the rear camp. The knights, however, reassured her, stating that protecting her was their duty as imperial knights. One knight, in particular, emphasized this point, unaware that these were to be his last words. Cyan sensed danger and urgently yelled for everyone to move. The confused knight didn't notice the ogre's hand reaching for him until it was too late. The ogre grabbed and squeezed him until he coughed up blood. The scene was horrifying for Princess Aran. Cyan quickly positioned himself in front of her, ordering her to step back. The ogre's sinister smile confirmed Cyan's suspicion, it was targeting him. Cyan told the others that he would distract the ogre while they escaped with the princess. Emily responded with an enthusiastic okay, leaving Cyan momentarily dumbfounded. She grabbed Princess Aran and urged the remaining knight to move, comically irritating Cyan with her eagerness to flee. The ogre roared loudly, demanding Cyan's attention. Cyan unsheathed his sword, leapt high, and slashed the ogre's arm. He pondered why advanced rank demonic beasts seemed drawn to him, suspecting they were detecting something from him. Karam, appearing amused, explained that his strength came from consuming the blood of countless demonic beasts, which made him reek of them, thus attracting their attention. Cyan was both surprised and annoyed that Karam had known this all along and was only telling him now. She grinned and reminded him of her desire for his body, to which Cyan responded by grabbing her tightly, making her groan, and then assumed a combat stance. Karam asked what he was doing and requested gentler treatment, but Cyan curtly told her to shut up. Standing resolute before the ferocious ogre, he declared that he didn't care how many monsters came at him. As the ogre attacked, Cyan swiftly countered, slicing its arm before it could strike. The ogre roared in pain, and Cyan followed up with another powerful attack. As Cyan's final attack landed, the ogre fell in defeat. Sensing that no one was watching, Cyan decided to take a sip of the advanced rank demonic beast blood. Karam got excited about the feast, but Cyan was suddenly shocked by the sight of a large purple claw gripping the edge of a nearby cliff. It belonged to a devil dragon. The creature roared loudly, and Karam explained that it was still a baby and must have been drawn by Cyan's scent. However, Cyan wasn't concerned with why the dragon was there, he activated his demonic sword, ready to confront it. He instructed Karam to catch and consume the dragon. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the remaining ogres were being struck down by the emperor's lightning. After the last ogre fell, the emperor asked Villarth if that was the final one. The duke confirmed it seemed so, but the emperor was not entirely satisfied. He inquired about the princess and the duke's son, but Villarth apologized, stating that he found no traces beyond the tent. The emperor, recognizing the duke's worry for his son, assured him it was understandable. Villarth insisted that the princess's safety was the priority. 
the emperor, about to scold the duke for his perceived coldness, instead remarked on it, to which the duke replied that his son, Avert, knew how to take care of himself. Just then, a knight reported that they had located the princess. The emperor, seeking confirmation, was relieved when Princess Aran appeared. He immediately rushed to her, grabbing her shoulders and asking if she was hurt. In a panic, Princess Aran insisted they hurry to save someone. The emperor, confused, asked who she meant. Aran, crying, revealed that it was Cyan, blaming herself for the situation. Behind the emperor, the duke stood tense, his posture stiffening. The emperor urged the princess to calm down and explain what happened. The duke then approached Emily, inquiring if she was Cyan's maid. With a frightening expression, he demanded to know if something had happened to Cyan. Trembling, Emily, who had never seen the duke so intimidating, stuttered as she explained that the young master had acted as bait to allow them time to escape. The duke's brows furrowed with concern. A knight then reported that he remembered Cyan's last known location and offered to lead a rescue effort. The emperor, turning to Villarth, asked what he was waiting for and urged him to hurry. The duke's expression turned menacing as he declared that they would not be launching a rescue mission. Princess Aran was taken aback, and the emperor questioned if he was serious. The duke explained that their priority should be stabilizing the situation, if the camps fell, the demonic beasts would invade the empire. He insisted they must focus on reconstructing the defenses immediately to prevent further casualties. Emily's tears flowed as she asked what would happen to the young master. The knight clenched his teeth in frustration. The duke responded that Cyan had fulfilled his duty by aiding in the princess's evacuation, emphasizing that this was the responsibility of Avert. The emperor and princess Aran both appeared sullen, with Aran blaming herself for the predicament. Suddenly, a loud monster cry pierced the air. Everyone's attention shifted upwards, where they saw a dragon soaring through the sky. Princess Aran could hardly believe her eyes when she noticed a person clinging to the dragon's leg. Upon closer inspection, it was Cyan, holding on tightly as the dragon flew. His grip was firm, but his expression betrayed a mix of silent tears and reluctant determination. The sight was almost comical, given the dire circumstances. And with that, we must conclude for today. If you enjoyed this part and want to see what happens next, please like and subscribe. Thank you.